evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Don Barry, Chair of the Physical Sciences Department here at, uh, here at Mesa College. And, and uh, tonight we're very pleased to have a couple of uh, gentlemen who are going to uh, lecture us tonight about uh, self-driving vehicle technology. And uh, they're here with Barton Labs. And uh, Mr. Scoopian was on the original design team who first came up with the, this, uh, uh, what maybe is the world's first uh, self-driving shuttle. Is that, is that the case? Pretty close. OK, yeah. So we're going to hear about how the technology works tonight. Then if you want to hang around for a few minutes after the lecture, in my understanding, it's not too long of a lecture, we'll actually go out and get to see the vehicle, and you'll get to a uh, chance to ride in the self-driving shuttle. So uh, please welcome uh, Mike Scoopian. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm, I'm Mike, uh, and I'm representing Varden Labs. And uh, um, as Don said, we make vehicles drive themselves. So I'll uh, start off by a quote from a pretty well-known movie, The Social Network. Uh, the quote goes, a million dollars isn't cool. You know what's cool? A billion dollars. Well, self-driving is a $1.3 trillion market. Uh, so that's a 1,000 billions, uh, which is a significantly larger number um, than, uh, yeah, it's even fathomable. Um, so kind of going into self-driving, um, there's kind of four different classifications of vehicles um, that you can see on highways. So uh, there's kind of level zero self-driving, which we don't even bother showing. Um, that's kind of like there's zero technology into a vehicle. Um, basically, you have an engine, you have a, an accelerator pedal, you press the accelerator pedal, you go. Um, now, uh, each of these levels kind of corresponds to a different level of automation of uh, you know, vehicles and, and of self-driving vehicles. So starting with level one, there's basically like a single function has been automated in a vehicle. So that might be something like um, electronic um, Braking, so or uh, ABS. So when you, uh, for example, are slipping on ice, you know it'll the computer will control um, the individual braking of all the wheels in order for you to come to a stop uh, sooner than you would have. Then there's level two where there are multiple functions that are interacting with one another. So this might include something like uh, a cruise control system and a radar, which is basically in front of the vehicle and is looking for how far away your vehicle is from the car in front of you. And if you're getting too close, you know, slow down and make sure you, you maintain a, an appropriate distance. Then you move on to level three, which is kind of this co-pilot system, which is what Tesla um, has been talking about and has been pushing out to all of their vehicles recently, um, where you have more than just those two functions. And finally, there's level four self-driving, where you no longer even have to be you know, paying attention to the road. You can sit back, relax, be on your on your phone, reading a book, whatever you want. So self-driving uh, kind of affects a significant number of, of industries. Um, obviously, you know, we have consumer vehicles that everybody um, basically in, in North America owns, um, and we, we drive around them in them every day. Uh, but there's a lot of industries that also use vehicles for transportation that are, that are going to be affected. So for example, taxis. Um, so uh, Uber you know, has, has really dominated the taxi industry over the past few years. Um, they just spent or went out uh, with over a billion dollars to build uh, a factory for producing self-driving vehicles. Um, then there's you know the delivery industry, so delivering goods uh, both for like mail but also for parcels, you know across across the country. Uh, and that includes freight and and ride sharing, um, which kind of goes along with the taxi industry. Um, there are a number of like challenges and uh, different things that are affected as a result of self-driving. So industries are obviously uh, positively influenced, but there's a lot of kind of these negative influences. Uh, so for example, there's the whole trolley problem, which is a, a very common ethics problem, where uh, you can imagine you're in a self-driving vehicle and it's going down the road, and in its path there are uh, two people standing in the road, and there are three people sitting in the vehicle. And so, you know, the car can make the choice, or sorry, uh, one person sitting in the vehicle, the car can make the choice. Do I continue going and hit these two people? You know, I can't stop. Or do I veer off the side of the road, not hit those two people, and injure the person inside? So it's like a very, very common ethics problem. Um, and there's no real solution to it. Um, but it's, it's obviously a challenge that kind of goes along with self-driving vehicles or any kind of technology where humans are no longer involved. Uh, then there's the regulation. So on public roadways, self-driving vehicles aren't actually legal right now. Um, you can get a testing license where you have to have two people, uh, one in the driver's seat and one in the passenger seat, and they are always responsible for any accidents or anything that takes place. Um, but currently on public roads, you're not actually allowed to run without a driver. That's, however, different in the private industry, which is why uh, Varden Labs is actually tackling uh, in-campus transportation, which I'll get into further later. Um, then there's liabilities associated, so who's responsible? Is it the car manufacturer? Is it the um, technology manufacturer? There's a lot of kind of 
stuff up in the air there. And uh, obviously a lot of retraining. I mean, it's a completely, it, it would basically change the entire transportation industry. Um, so lots of, lots of people are affected by it. Um, so there are a number of players. I'm sure you guys have heard of Google. Uh, Tesla is, is obviously you know, working on their level three automation and, and hoping to get to level four. Um, there's been a lot of rumors about Apple working on it. Um, and Uber, as I mentioned, you know, raised a multi-billion dollar round, went over to Carnegie Mellon, the top computer science or programming school in the world, uh, bought out half of their robotics division, paid them seven-figure signing bonuses, and set up shop across the street. Uh, so Uber is, is trying very hard. And actually, uh, another player most recently is, uh, you may have heard of the, the acquisition that GM recently made, uh, which was for uh, Cruise, which was a self-driving car company they acquired for over a billion dollars. Um, just last month. Uh, so here is Google's self-driving car. Um, you know, we see them running around all over the place uh, in the Bay Area where we're from. Uh, probably not a lot down here. This is Tesla's uh, Model S. Uh, there's Uber's self-driving car. There's only a couple photos of this guy. This is one of them circulating the internet. And uh, then there's us. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we're Varden Labs and we're also in the, in the self-driving space, but in a slightly different uh, niche. So um, this is kind of a, a spectrum of transportation. Um, you can see on the left there's you know, a person, then you move on to kind of these uh, personalized transportation mediums like segways or uh, hoverboards recently. Then you can move up to bikes at you know, slightly higher speeds, again, still individual mobility. Um, and then kind of, I'll skip along us for a second, then you move on to public transportation, uh, and then eventually, you know, subway systems and even greater public transportation, and then eventually uh, the most free and easy mobility platform, which is your car. So we kind of sit right in the middle. We're trying to bridge the gap basically between um, human transportation or individual human transportation and kind of this public transportation system that we have, um, kind of solving what's called the last mile problem. So bringing people from uh, public transportation hubs to their home. Uh, so that's kind of our end goal. And to get there, um, we're actually working on this vehicle. So he's sitting outside, and you'll be able to ride him. This is a video of him. Um, as you can see, there's nobody in the vehicle. It sees pedestrians. It stops for them. Um, here, the vehicle is going to come around, pick up a couple passengers, and be on its way. And you guys will have a ride, so I'm just going to skip over this. Um, so yeah, we're basically making this self-driving shuttle. So we're starting off in private campuses like this, where, um, as I said before, there's, there's uh, no regulation that basically prohibits us from running without a driver. Um, this is a fully electric uh, vehicle, self-driving. The goal is to seat uh, somewhere between uh, four and 20 people. That's actually about closer to 11 to 15. Four to 20 is kind of the, the, the big number, or the, the big spread. And uh, at a top speed of about, of about 15 miles an hour to start. Uh, so that's kind of uh, a good top speed that we've found for in-campus transportation. Um, most campuses have a top speed of 15 miles an hour anyway. And basically, as we drive more and more, we'll be able to gather uh, enough data to improve all of our uh, systems to, to run at higher speeds and, and tackle bigger problems. So moving away from you know, the campus transportation space and moving into that last mile problem that I just described. Um, so why driverless shuttles? Where, well, first of all, they're a lot safer. Um, you know, 32,000 people in the US die every year because of car accidents. Um, Self-driving vehicles or computers uh, are, are capable of doing things significantly more reliably, or, or significantly more reliably. Uh, so they're able to actually run, uh, when properly trained, better than a human would be able to. Uh, they're also more cost effective because you're no longer paying a driver or multiple drivers to sit in a vehicle uh, however long you actually need the, these shuttles operating for. Uh, they're sustainable because they're fully electric. And they save a lot of time because uh, rather than having to set up you know, fixed routes where this, this person is just driving uh, from you know, around a single loop, you can actually have kind of like an Uber dispatch system where you have your phone, you can pull out your phone, tap, tap to request a shuttle, and it'll actually come pick you up wherever you are and drop you off wherever you need to go. So self-driving is, is a huge data play. Uh, I kind of briefly, briefly talked about this, but basically what we're doing right now is we're just collecting data. We're in a space where we can actually run without a driver and gather miles. Miles is like the big thing. Um, how many miles you have basically means how much, how much uh, data, how much footage you have of your environment um, as you progress through time. So if you just drive down a single stretch of road and you see you know, a person jump out in front of you, um, now, if you've run down that one stretch of road once, you saw that person jump out in front of you, 
and hopefully you can stop for that person, but you don't know uh, all the other possible things that could happen um, while you're driving down this road. So you know now that like humans have the potential to jump out in front of you. You need to be able to handle that. But you don't know about all the weird, crazy things that might happen. And the only way to actually understand how to, how to uh, get past those kind of situations is to actually encounter them and get data about them and build uh, software which is able to handle them. Uh, so that's kind of this idea where we're starting with campus transportation where we can get uh, a huge number of vehicles out running without a driver collecting data and basically um, being used to improve all the software that we already have to go into last mile. Um, so why now? Well basically self-driving hasn't been um, it hasn't been feasible up until recently. So one of the biggest sensors that we have on our vehicle is a laser scanner called a LiDAR. Um, the price of a sensor that would have worked for our vehicle two years ago was about $70,000 just for this one sensor. Last year, the same company came out with a sensor that was $8,000. That's what we currently have on our vehicle. And a significant number of companies um, have just started up last year, which are boasting sub-$1,000 sensors of similar capabilities by 2017. So as sensor prices drop, um, you know, this technology is actually feasible for the, the masses and not just uh, research institutes that can pour hundreds of thousands of dollars into these sensors. And then kind of as we progress forward, you know, sensor prices are going to continue to drop, but all these companies which are now springing up all over the place, including all the big players like Google, Tesla, Apple, um, they're going to all take over the market. So this is kind of this brief window where the technology doesn't exist yet, but it's capable of existing. Uh, and so that's why we're starting now. So for our market, we've identified 7,800 sorry, 7,800 large campuses, uh, which would be a perfect fit for our technology. And this includes, you know, large universities or or colleges, international airports, theme parks, uh, large military bases. And if you do the math, those 7,800 campuses, assuming eight shuttles on every campus, remember these are large campuses. Uh, so that that number does make sense. Uh, at $50,000 a shuttle a year, that's a $3.1 billion market. So obviously that's not $1.3 trillion like what I talked about before, but this market is large enough that we can tackle and hopefully dominate the space and uh, be outside of, of kind of what Google and all these large players are doing, um, sticking to our own little niche. So our shuttle, uh, as you can see a picture of it here, um, works very similar to a lot of, a lot of other self-driving car uh, companies. Um, basically, the way that it works is we first pre-program our paths. So we come to a, a, a campus like this, and we basically drive all of our routes, all of the paths within a campus manually. So we have a joystick, we control the vehicle with that joystick, and we actually drive it, you know, uh, throttle, steering, and everything, and drive it through every single route and 3D map our environment. And with that 3D map, we can actually figure out, you know, where the roads are and where we're allowed to drive, and then in the future, know exactly how to navigate from any point on campus to any other point on campus. So I'll kind of get into a, a little bit more, or I'll get into a little bit more depth in how the technology works. Um, so the first kind of aspect of self-driving is localization. How does the vehicle know where it is at any given time? Um, so I mentioned before that we have this 3D laser scanner on the roof. Now other sensors that we have include a really high accuracy GPS, which as you know is, is good for figuring out where you are. Now your phone GPS is only accurate to within about uh, 10 feet uh, anywhere on, in the world. The GPS that we have in our vehicle is accurate to within about an inch. Um, so we're able to actually drive with that GPS almost exclusively, um, which is kind of what enabled us to move so quickly. Now, one other technology that you can, that you can use uh, if you don't want to spend so much on a GPS unit, uh, which we're currently working on, is something called SLAM. Now, that's what this video is kind of showing. Um, basically, as this car is driving around this path, it's mapping its environment. And basically, as it maps, it's constantly um, adding in information as it drives into this three-dimensional map. Um, now one of the problems with, with this technique is as you drive, um, your GPS, like although it's really accurate, um, it's not to the level of precision that you would need in order to create really, really high accuracy maps. Um, so what this video is demonstrating is a technology called SLAM. Um, basically the way it works, it stands for Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. Uh, but the general principle works like this. So I'm standing over here. And I have this, this sensor which is able to produce a 3D scan of my environment. So I'm able to pick up a, a full 3D map of everything, all the chairs, all the people, all the walls. Now if I take a scan here and then move one meter, and I take another scan, 
I can try to pick out key features of both of those scans, like for example, the location of walls, the location of uh, the roof or the chairs, and try to figure out how far away those two scans would have been based off of how far away all the objects in the scan are. Right? So if I'm standing here and I scan that chair, it's about two meters away. Take a step forward, now it's a meter away. If I do that for every object in the room, I can actually figure out how far I've moved. And that's what this video is demonstrating. So they're actually doing that technique where they're constantly looking at how far they've moved every single scan as they drive and create this full 3D map. Um, so this is, this is actually a video of our uh, original prototype uh, from about a year ago now. Uh, as you can see on the bottom, uh, bottom right side here, this is actually a top-down view of that 3D uh, data that we're getting. So you can see all these scans corresponds to scans across the ground. Uh, so each of these lines is basically showing the ground. And if you look closely, you can see me walking around here. So I'm kind of this abnormality. I'm actually showing up as a black square here. Uh, this is our software running on top of this 3D data, figuring out where objects are and picking out um, basically anything that's, that's uh, tall and, and vertical shaped. So like a car or a person or uh, a rock or a dog. And you can see when the, when the car here rounds the corner, it actually picks me up right here. And I'm in its path, which is this green kind of oval that it's driving. And so it, it stops for me and, and waits until I get out of the way. So that's kind of the, the next step. So it, uh, rather than just knowing where you are, you also need to be able to avoid objects. So that's kind of showing uh, this object avoidance here. And obviously, the last step, um, you know, it's great to have all these sensors and all the software. But you need some way of actually controlling a vehicle. Um, right? it's, it's not just simulation anymore. It's actually real life. Uh, so these are kind of two pictures showing uh, some of the technology that went into actually making our, our vehicle drive itself. Uh, so we don't make our own car. We basically just take a car existing off the shelf and put uh, motors and actuators into that vehicle, which enable a computer to control the systems. So you can see here, uh, this is kind of a, a very rough view of, of our car. This is kind of the roof. This is the bottom chassis. It's kind of missing all the seats and everything in the middle. Um, but you can see here, this is the steering system, this is the brake, uh, this is an emergency brake system, and you can see uh, a GPS antenna on the roof there. And then this guy here is just a picture of our electrical system, which is all kind of tucked away inside the nose of the vehicle, uh, hidden from view. So yeah, that's kind of uh, a, a view of, of self-driving and of our technology. Um, we're Varden Labs, uh, and our vehicle is outside, so if you guys uh, are up for it, um, we've kind of made a little path around around uh, the courtyard here that we'd love to take you, for, take you for a ride in. Ah, yes, questions. So what about the, the loading and unloading of the vehicle? What type of sensors and electronics are involved in that? Yeah, so everything that we've done to this point has been just surrounding kind of the core self-driving aspect of the vehicle. Um, it's great to think about all these, all these methods of user interaction and interface and all of that. But until you have a self-driving car that works, um, you know, that, that should be the primary focus. Um, so we haven't done any kind of uh, development into those kind of systems, but the general principle works like this. Um, you would basically, everybody has, or most people now have a smartphone, um, so everybody within a campus would have an app on their smartphone which allows them to interact with the vehicle and control the vehicle with their own phone. Um, now in addition to that, there's going to be a touch screen basically in the vehicle which allows people to uh, punch in where they want to go um, and uh, whether or not they want to get off you know, mid-route. Um, so that enables them to control the vehicle. And uh, in terms of sensors to basically monitor the people inside the vehicle and around the vehicle, um, we're basically going to have cameras all the way around the vehicle, which allow us to see where people are. And so if, for example, somebody calls a shuttle, it appears, and then they're busy talking to their colleague right beside you know, for five minutes, which is you know, long enough that the vehicle's like, oh, I guess nobody's coming, let's, let's drive away. Those cameras will allow the vehicle to see those people, know that they're waiting to get in the vehicle, and uh, wait for them instead of, instead of driving away. And then in addition to that, uh, basically sensors that um, will only allow the vehicle to start when all the doors are closed, and uh, when all the seatbelts are fastened for everybody that's sitting. Yeah? How long would the, how long would the upgrade period be? So like, like you're seeing that the technology is getting old, when would you replace it? Um, so that's a very good question. Uh, it really depends on the state of, of uh, how far along the technology is, uh, because it, it's moving so quickly. Like right now in the early stages, things are being replaced 
every six months, basically. Um, and there's no real stability because things are just getting so much better that it doesn't make any sense to use the old technology. Um, so like that laser scanner that I talked about, um, you know, if, if somebody had developed on technology that was two years old now, um, they would be spending $70,000 when they could have been spending like five. Um, so it doesn't really make sense. So in, in this infancy, we're seeing like a year, six months to a year turnaround time. Um, but when, when vehicles are actually running on streets, um, there, there really won't be a need to upgrade the physical systems. It'll all be the software. So once you have all of the sensors and everything outfitted on a vehicle, um, that's not the end point. You know, obviously, you have to work on your software. And um, self-driving cars aren't, are never going to be perfect. You know, they're always going to get into accidents. Um, the only way that they could possibly be perfect is if everything was controlled. If there was no random variation, if there was no, you know, a self-driving car can't predict somebody jumping off a bridge on a highway right as they're crossing and, you know, come to a collision. You, you can't predict anything like that. So there's always going to be accidents. But it's a matter of figuring out how to avoid them um, based off of uh, when they happen and upgrade the, technolo upgrade the software to try to avoid those situations in the future. Yeah. Oh, I guess we'll go with you. Oh, and just, just a couple comments. It just it, it occurs to me that uh, you know one real advantage is self-driving shuttles can't consume alcohol. So yes. That's, <laughs> that's a real advantage. And I'm imagining too they're smart enough that they can look at their cell phones and also not mess up as they're driving at the same time. Yeah. So the big thing of, of self-driving cars um, in comparison to to human drivers, obviously there's the big distraction thing. Um, you know, a computer isn't going to get distracted. It's going to continuously monitor its environment like it's been programmed to. And the only time it fails is if like, things really go haywire. And then you have redundant systems built into everything such that you know, if a computer crashes, there's a second computer waiting there ready to take over in that event. Um, now, other things, other cool things that self-driving cars allow you to do uh, other than distractions, um, you know, the, the most common time for people to get into fatal accidents is during I mean, you guys don't experience this, experience this, but in Canada we do snowstorms, right? Or heavy rain, or fog, or even the nighttime. Um, and so self-driving cars, because they're actually, you know, they're, they've been programmed to do this, they're able to monitor the weather systems and monitor how much visibility they have and actually slow down accordingly, which is something that humans don't do, right? Humans think they're invincible. They see rain, they're like, ah, I can drive through that, and then they get into an accident. Um, and so by having that kind of control, um, we're able to, to slow down and make decisions better when, when visibility is not good. Yeah? Would you be able to manually operate it if need to be? Yeah, so we don't want to normally give, give that ability. Um, there, there's a, a lot of talk regarding um, human interaction with self-driving vehicles, and we actually put a lot of thought into it for our systems. Um, so for us, like, we don't have a steering wheel or pedals. All we have is this joystick. Um, we talked about having, having a steering wheel a lot, because um, for testing, you know, having a steering wheel allows you to have a, a firm grasp of control. You have a mechanical link between your hands and the wheels, rather than this joystick, which is connected to a computer, which is connected to a motor, which is connected to the steering system. Um, but in the end, you know, if you're controlling something like the, the throttle with this joystick and steering with, the, with the, your hand, um, now you have like two mixed signals in your brain. And your intuitive reaction when you have to stop when you're holding a steering wheel is to hit the brakes, right? But you're not, you no longer have a brake pedal, you're now holding this, the, the uh, uh, joystick. So what you should have done is pulled back on the joystick. But there's a lot of like intuitive problems with humans um, when they're accustomed to driving the normal way, um, which kind of influence these self-driving vehicles. So having the ability to take over control manually is actually a similar problem. Um, a lot of the time, you know, we just have to learn to trust that the computer is going to make the right choice. They're going to do it right. You know, we fly in airplanes all the time. Um, airplanes are almost, almost entirely run by a computer now. You know, airplanes take off, they land, they, they fly almost entirely with a computer. Only in like really heavy weather or systems where those computers haven't been trained to run will the pilots take over, or if they're like having fun or doing training or whatever. Um, but I mean, airplane accidents um, are so infrequent now. Uh, there hasn't been a, an, an accident uh, with a, a U.S. airliner uh, since like 2001, 2002, something ridiculous like that. Like the, the accidents rate just, they don't exist because there is no human interaction anymore. So it's really just learning to trust computer systems. <laughs>
Yep. Um, so I imagine you guys would have like um, an on-site technician for each place that you put it. So would it ever like become where it's just another part of the janitorial's job to just check on the computers? Yeah, I mean, a lot of, a lot of campuses actually already have shuttle systems, um, whether it be um, run by, by just the people driving or by the organization. Uh, so some campuses will like rent uh, shuttle services, and in that case, it's just the driver that, that you know, drives a single route. Um, but there are actually campuses where they have full dish bat systems. They have you know, a team of people that are sitting by a phone, getting, getting calls, and, and sending, sending cars out to pick these people up. Um, so in that kind of a situation, there would be like that, that group of people in charge of the vehicles. Um, but really, with the system that we're trying to make, um, it's a single person's job. Um, basically, with a single, with a single uh, like iPad tablet, they're able to monitor their entire fleet, dispatch vehicles if they ever need to, monitor all the vehicles, and the vehicles will, will self-charge, they'll drive themselves, um, so there won't really be um, any, any major human interaction anymore. It's kind of like we come in, we install the system, and we leave, and everything will just work. Um, but in the off chance that it doesn't, um, we're always going to be monitoring the systems. Our plan is never to actually sell the vehicles mainly to, to lease them kind of a, as a software, as a service kind of, kind of model, where you're, you're giving this service and you're still in control of everything. Um, if a vehicle were to malfunction, you could always bring in a new vehicle, swap it out, um, malfunction in a good way. Hopefully all, all our redundant systems you know, will keep everybody safe. Um, and also monitoring um, for if the vehicle gets stuck. So one of the big problems with self-driving vehicles, uh, for us anyway, is not the safety aspect, um, the safety can be solved with a lot of redundant systems. But the big thing is being able to handle all the different possible situations that you might encounter. Um, so you basically when you start with self-driving technology, you start very, very conservatively, much like a human does when they start driving, right? Any little thing that's, that's moving around, people will freak out for it and slam on the brakes. And that's basically how our vehicle performs right now. Um, so any little thing that's wrong and the vehicle will just come to a stop because it doesn't know how to handle it, it doesn't want to make a mistake, so stopping is just the right thing to do. Um, obviously, you can't do that on a highway driving at you know, 65 miles an hour, but at the 15 mile an hour speed limit that we run at, slamming on the brakes is a great solution. Um, so uh, basically being able to uh, take the information from when a vehicle stopped and doesn't know how to proceed, send that back to us and be able to like, remotely control the vehicles is basically how we're solving any kind of um, interaction problems. Well, so you have a camera system for obstacle detection, uh, clearly. What's the resolution of that? If you have a small animal in front, is it going to catch that as well? Yeah, so it's, it's not actually a camera system. Um, it's called a LiDAR. The way it works is basically there's 16 lasers um, that spin 20 times a second. And as these lasers spin, um, they're, they're infrared, so you can't see them. Um, they're basically emitting small packets of light. And they measure, they, they actually, like, they send out that light, and light takes time to travel. You don't see it, it happens extremely quickly, but it, it actually is able to measure the amount of time that it takes for that light to run off, bounce off of an object, and come back to the sensor. And based off of that time, and knowing what the speed of light is, you can actually calculate how far away that object was. And so um, these 16 lasers spin 20 times a second, and as they spin, they're constantly firing off packets of light and measuring the amount of time that it takes for it to come back, uh, about 300,000 times a second. Um, so the resolution is technically 300,000 points a second, um, spinning 20, 20 times a second. And if you think about the way that the sensor works, um, these 16 lasers um, are, are spread in a 30 degree field of view. So each laser basically has a two degree separation between, between each. And as they spin, they fire off about a, a quarter of a degree at a time. So you kind of have this polar resolution where as you move farther and farther away, because you're not dealing with offsets, you're dealing with angles, um, you kind of lose resolution the farther away you go. So we can only really see something the shape of like a dog uh, about 20 meters away. Um, but as things get closer, uh, we basically, anything that we see, we'll start slowing down for it regardless of what it is. And then as, as we get closer, we'll be able to tell what it is and then make decisions re regarding it from there. Yeah. Um. Is there any chance, I know that um, police radar guns sometimes use infrared. Is there any chance that it would freak out the system? Yeah, so police radar guns work slight, I mean, they could use infrared, but most radar 
works on a different, uh, different frequency spectrum, typically about 24 megahertz. Yeah, so, so it's a little, a little bit off. Um, but, but in saying that, the sun actually emits a, a lot of infrared light. Um, we don't see it, but a lot of it. Um, and if you look at the sensor data, you can actually see a clear cone of like random sporadic points where the sun's rays are coming from. Um, so it does affect the sensor, and theoretically other sensors will also affect other sensors, right? These lasers can, as they spin, they could theoretically bounce into another sensor and affect those readings. And you could even have infrared flashlights, and you could do a lot of things. Um, but the biggest thing that prevents problems as a result of this is just filtering your data. So um, when we see all these kind of speckly points kind of floating around, we're able to figure out, you know, this is a single point which is floating in midair. There is nothing around it. It's probably fake. OK, so this is our vehicle. Um, you saw a video of it inside. Uh, I'll just turn it on here. Yeah, so Mike was saying um, indoors that there are two main technologies to make this work. Um, and they're pretty much on the roof here. We've got a high accuracy GPS and a LiDAR. So this is one of two GPS antennas. So we've got one here and one on the other side. And that gives us a really precise position and orientation because we have two of them. Um, in addition to that, we've got the LiDAR there. That's the, the puck thing. Um, so that's, as Mike was saying, is the eyes of the system. It's how it's able to detect objects. It's how it's able to figure out where it is. Um, so with those two pieces, um, we're able to make what, it's, what we call the minimum viable product for a self-driving vehicle. Um, in addition to that, we've got, um, we've ripped out the steering wheel um, and replaced it with this joystick and there's also no pedals inside. So um, that's the only way to control the vehicle. Um, in the nose of the vehicle, we've got our computer system. Um, there was also a picture of that in the slide, I don't know if you remember. Um, and then we've got motors and actuators to sort of interface with the vehicle. Um, so I can give you a little... Uh, look of what's on the screen here. That's So here we've got a top-down view of the world um, that the, the computer is actually able to see. So right now we have a path loaded. Um, I pre-recorded a route um, just about an hour ago just to do a little loop in, in the little plaza here. Um, so the green lines there, that's the path that it wants to go. So we are just right here by the little red line. And then the green and blue lines are where the vehicle wants to go. Um, now you can also see our object detection algorithms running in real time here. So that black dot there, that's actually Mike walking around. So as he moves back and forth, you can see that he's highlighted on the screen. That means the computer knows where he is and is able to take the appropriate action to ensure that the vehicle is still safe. Um, and if I zoom out here, all the colors that you see are sort of what's coming back from the LiDAR. And you can actually see that it, it has a very, very long range. It's about 300 feet at, at its most extremes. Um, so here's sort of a 3D view of what's happening. So right there is Mike. You can actually see his arms moving. Yeah. And then we've got him highlighted there in the gray and black. I mean, we could probably just uh, run it now. Yeah, are you hooked up to the back button? So it's kind of back. All right, so uh, on the back here, we've got a few buttons. Uh, just to give a rundown. So um, rather than running without a driver, um, we kind of try to keep everything a little bit safer as we're in testing and development. So we have uh, what, what everyone calls a safety driver. Basically, somebody in the vehicle to take over control in the event that something goes wrong. Um, now, we don't actually have any control of the vehicle except for the fact that we're holding down a button. Um, so when we press and hold this black button here, uh, it's called a dead man switch. Basically, you have to be holding it in order to enable the vehicle. And if you were to ever let go, then the vehicle will come to a, to a stop for you um, in the event that something goes wrong. And then we've also got this green button where uh, if we want to proceed past the shuttle stop, we'll basically tap the green button and it'll continue on its way. Um, the yellow button's not used and the red button is for a safety system. So if anything were to go wrong in the vehicle, um, basically, there's an emergency brake underneath uh, the seats here. It's a couple springs being held back by an electromagnet, 
which is just a magnet which only works when you apply power to it. And so that magnet is holding back those springs from being fired. If I press this button, <laughs> power is released from that magnet and the same thing will happen if you know the computer crashes or if anything goes wrong. Uh, and those springs basically pull on the parking brake of the vehicle uh, and allows the vehicle to come to a quick stop. And then the old parking brake is basically how we reset that system. <laughs> so now it's, it's right back to being locked and loaded. So uh, whoever, whoever wants to go first, we can take three people at a time. Uh, Brandon will be in the back seat here, kind of making sure everything's great. And uh, we're going to take the passengers. Who wants to go first? You want to take each one? Right. I'll take the front seat. Yeah. Chuck and still applies, right? Yes, it does. I was going to say, like, how many, uh, many self-driving vehicles uh, have been raised? I'll just center this view, so I'm just going to press the button here. Hit the go button, and the vehicle will start driving itself. So here we go. So as you can see, it's sort of tracking the path that was pre-recorded on the screen there. Oh, here we go. It's being a little bit cautious. Um, it doesn't like that garbage can. Just no. <laughs> so he showed up as the black dot there on the screen. On the screen there, you can see the white dots. That's the uh, the trees that it sees. So it's recognizing that that's something that it doesn't have to take into account. That's a dark spot. Is it because it's higher up? Yes, because. So now, if you look on screen there, they're actually in our path. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of just waiting for them. <laughs> What's that noise? That's um... that's the motor that we have oh, yeah, sir, right where the steering wheel used to be. Wow. And then we pre-programmed to stop right here. Oh, nice. Okay. Uh, at its best. Now with with the whole SLAM system where you're using your 3D data, you can get to within like a quarter of an inch. Wow. Accuracy. Wow. So like before the, the screen there, pop them. you can see that little black dot yeah, here. Yeah. That's actually yeah. dangerous yeah. garbage can. Yeah. Being a little bit cautious around. Could be a person, never know. Up. Here you'll see Mike sort of show up on the laser system of the black line. Yeah. Uh, slows down. Um, when he's off to the side, it slows down in anticipation that he will pop in front of our passer slow. And if you were to jump in front of us, we're already going to slow down. 